you have your Bibles, let us go to Luke chapter 14 and verse 16. Read a little bit of a story there, and then we're going to go. You're going to understand. The Bible says, And then Jesus, he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servants at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. Everybody say, All things are now ready. Verse 21, then the master of the house said to the servant, go out quickly into the streets of the city, the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, the maim, the lame, and the blind. Verse 22, and the servant said, master, I have done as you commanded, and there is still room. Everybody say, there is still room. No, say it like you mean, there is still room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Everybody say that my house may be filled. Turn to your neighbor, the one that you like. If you're watching alone, you can just look at yourself. If you're watching with somebody, look at the person. Turn to the one, those of you in the room, your neighbor that you like, look them in in their eye and say, I like you. Forget about this other person. Then look them in there and say, pass the notes, pass the notes, pass the notes. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege to hear your word. We come against every distraction and hesitation, resistance, like we have said. Every itchy ear is calm right now. Our spirits are receptive to your word. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And Father, you know how hot it is outside. If you bring down the temperature by five degrees, we will not be upset. In the name of Jesus. Amen. You can have your own seats. You can swallow for presence. Thank you, Jesus. How many of us have ever left a review about like a restaurant or a place that we went to? No, like serious. How many of you like review people, Yelp? Like you have a Yelp account and it's thriving. <laughs> like people are scared of you when you come to the restaurant. They're like, oh my God. Um, Golden Spoon 006 is here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. How many of you also have um, seen a movie, gone to a show? been to a restaurant, been to um, a city, a place, and then you shared it with somebody, told somebody about it. Hands up if, if that's you. Awesome. Now, did you shoot the film? The film that you told them to go see? I, I, I the one that sh- shot the film? No, say it like, like, are you the one that shot the film? No. Do you own the movie? Did you make any, any money at all from them going to see that movie? No. Did you produce the movie? No. Do you own the restaurant that you were suggesting? You know what I mean? Do you live in the city? Like, let's say it's somewhere you went to Paris. Do you, do, do you live there? Do you own the hotel? Do you make any kind of income from this place that you're asking them to go to? Research shows that we like to share our experiences. And the number one reason why we like to share our experiences is because we have a strong emotional experience either a negative one or a positive one. Research actually shows that people who have a negative experience with somewhere, something, someplace, are two to three times more likely to leave a review or say something about it. On the other hand, another research shows that people who have a positive, a great experience, have a 54% chance of leaving a review. Why is this the case? Human beings are social beings to share our experience. We like to tell people what we have enjoyed and share that opportunity with them. We are social beings and sometimes we don't just share the experience, we actually pay for the person to have the experience. I was in Birmingham the other day and I, some years ago, and I ate this white chocolate bread pudding and I, 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 I could swear I saw Angel Gabriel and Michael in front of me. <laughs> Clearly, I saw them. It was so good, I, told some, I was at the pastor's conference, I told my friends, I gathered like six of them, and I said, hey, I just ate this white chocolate bread pudding, um, come, I will pay for you to go to heaven. <laughs> the only condition is that I'm going to watch you as you go to heaven. 
So I sat them down and I sat at the head of the table. This is a real, real life story. And then I didn't get anyone. I didn't want to be distracted. So I, I said, give them. <laughs> and they brought it. And I said, you may eat. And one by one, their spirits left their body. <laughs> It was so good, so good. But we do that. We're excited about sharing our friends. You see a movie, bro, this stuff was amazing. You go somewhere, oh, that hotel is incredible. I ate this great steak, whatever we like to share. Then the question then that, that, that begs is this. Why are we then more vocal about restaurants than we are about Jesus? Why are we more vocal about movies than we are about God. Why are we more vocal about a concert we've gone to or plan to go to than we are vocal about a place where people could find Jesus? Why are we more vocal about our political affiliations than we are about a God who is faithful to us? It's almost as if we go against our natural instinct to share our experience when it comes to God. We almost silence that thing in us that tells people about the good thing that we're enjoying when it comes to Jesus. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 14, here is another way to put it. God is not a secret to be kept. Everybody say God is not a secret to be kept. No, say it like you mean. Say God is not a secret to be kept. God is not reserved for any group of people, for any nationality, any gender, any affiliation. God is not reserved for anybody. The Bible actually says in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whoever, some traditions say, and everyone who believes in him should not perish. God is not a secret to be kept. God loves everyone. God is not a covert operator and the church is not a covert operation. God is not a secret service. God is not a secret to be kept. In fact, we see the first church in Acts chapter 2. The Bible says they were all in one place together in unison and then the Holy Spirit fell upon them. He fell and it was like divided tongues as of fire and they're all speaking in tongues and, 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 and they're enjoying the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We pick up the story in Acts chapter 2 verse 5 and people around began to hear. The Bible says, and there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from where? Every nation under heaven. Every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused. Why were they confused? Because everyone, again, every nation under heaven and everyone could hear them in their own language. When the Holy Spirit came, the first thing that was heard when the Holy Spirit came was not for a specific group of people. Yes, it fell on the 120 people, but the words that were spoken out of the mouths of these 120 people was for everyone, for every nation under the earth. Not for a select group of people. And what were they hearing? Verse 11 of Acts chapter 2 says, But the Jews and converts to Judaism, the Cretans, the Arabs, and we all hear these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. The, fact of, the first effect of the Holy Spirit after the speaking of strange tongues was to share the story about the wonderful things God has done. I could imagine, they could hear people in that, in that upper room saying, man, my my, my, my marriage was bad. People, people must have said, my, 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 my marriage was bad and all of a sudden Jesus turned it around. My health, I had this pain and God did something. People were also talking about the goodness of God. That's what they were hearing. They were not hearing the Bible. They were just hearing people say how good God is in their own language. Everyone who was within earshot could hear how good God is. God is for everyone. God is not for a specific group of people. God is not just for you and your friends. God is not a secret to be kept. God is not a secret to be kept. God is not someone we hide away. With this in mind, we look at the story in, 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 in Luke chapter 14, the Bible says that this story, Jesus is talking about a certain man that threw a party. And the Bible says he invited many people. How many of you know that one of the worst things that can happen to a party is that the people you invited 
don't come. Like, how many of you have had a party where you were there? You were amongst the one or one to six people who were there for a party of, of 20, 24. How many of you were there? The awkward feeling where there are more seats than there are actually human beings. How many of you have thrown that party? It was your party and no one came. Raise your hand. We're going to give you a consolation prize. I'm sorry. You had to go through that. But this man was determined. He was not going to have a bad, bad party. So what did he do? He sent his servant to invite everyone. But it's, it's, it's not possible to gain a good understanding of this story, this story of a great feast, if you don't understand the room in which it was being told. Luke chapter 14 verse 1 begins with Jesus going to a Pharisee's house for a meal. He was invited. And he goes, what is awkward about this is even in verse 1, he says that the Pharisees were watching him. And they were always watching him. To see a mistake he was going to, they were looking for something to accuse him of. They were looking for something to say that he did. These people were out to get Jesus. So my as I'm reading the Bible, I'm wondering why would Jesus go to the house of a Pharisee? This was not, they didn't just come. This was the house of a Pharisee. Why would Jesus go to the house of someone who is out to get him? Why would Jesus go to a room filled with people who are looking for him to die? A reason to kill him. Why would people, go, Jesus, endanger his life? And I was thinking about it and I realized that Jesus went there because he was invited. No complex, he was invited. Jesus is so desperate to connect with people that he will risk his life. To connect with people. Jesus is so desperate to be your friend that you will walk into a space filled with people looking for a reason to kill him just to be with you. Most of you have gotten the story of the gospel. Jesus, God, is so desperate that he will come into a world that rejected him trying to be your friend, knowing it will mean he's going to die. He's so desperate to connect with you, he will risk his life. In Luke chapter 9, I think, we see Zacchaeus. We see this man. In Luke chapter 19, we see this man. Short man could not see Jesus. He climbs a tree and then he's there just so he can get a, a vantage position to see Jesus as he was crossing. Jesus is so desperate to connect with this man in the tree. Jesus invites himself to the man's house. Say, hey, Zacchaeus, come down. Go and make food. I'm coming to your house. That's how desperate Jesus was to connect with this. The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, when you go down, Jesus was accused of eating with sinners and tax collectors. Tax collectors were like, everybody hated them. Because the, Jew, the, the, the Romans did something very clever. What did they do? They used Jews to take taxes from their brothers and sisters. So these brothers and sisters, they hated these guys. If you're a tax collector, nobody liked you. Nobody invited you. But guess who was with them? The one desperate to meet with them. The Bible says in Revelations chapter 3 verse 10, I think it says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. 3 verse 20, I knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Jesus is standing at the door of every house, every heart, and he's knocking. Reminds me of this child in our neighborhood. Our next door neighbors has beautiful child, handsome little boy. Every so Once in a while, he wants to play with Joel. And I am Pastor Ambi can be having a quiet evening. Evening, maybe just chilling, sitting down watching a movie, and all of a sudden there's this knock, do, 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 little child just going. We don't know who it is. Just do, 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 do. I'm like, who wants to die? Who wants a bullet in their kneecap? That's what I'm thinking. Then I think also I'm a pastor. You can't be doing that. Rockville-based pastor shoots church member. <laughs> then you open the door. There he is. So like, is Joel awake? I want to play. I'm like, Joel is sleeping now. Okay. And he goes, 15 minutes later, da, 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 da. He, he's still not here. Wow. He's still, he's still, wow. But da, 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 da. He does not care. No sense of decorum. No sense of, of sensitivity. That is what Jesus is doing. He does not care how he looks. He's knocking at the door of every heart of anyone who would open up to him. He doesn't care how long he's been knocking. For 2,000 years, he's been knocking. He does not care. All he's asking for is anyone who would open the door. The question then becomes, if Jesus is so eager to make friends, why do we keep him a secret? Why do we keep an eager Jesus a secret? 
It's not like he told you he doesn't want to be friends with people. He's eager to be friends with them. But we keep him a secret. It's in this premise now we can better understand Luke chapter 14 verse 16. Jesus is talking to this Pharisee actually, his host. And, he and the Bible says he says to him, a certain man gave a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come for all things are ready. The NLT says, come, the banquet is ready. Point number one, and if you're writing notes, please write this. The Bible says, oh, no, point number one, it says, God has thrown a big party. God has thrown a big party. God has thrown a big party. God throws the best party. God is so keen on connecting with us that he has thrown the best party. God has set the table, set the chairs, laid out the plates, the cutlery. He set the food and he said everything is ready. God has done everything he can for you to have a wonderful party. Most of you are wondering, where is this party and how did God um, throw a party? God threw a party when he sent Jesus to die to remove any obstacle that will hinder you from having access to him. God sent Jesus to die. Romans chapter 8 verse 31 says, what shall we then say to these things? He who did not withhold or spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him freely and graciously give us all everything? God sent Jesus to die so that the way is clear for you to come. God sent Jesus to die on your stead. And while Jesus was here, he said the same thing in John chapter 10 verse 10. He said, the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundant. Jesus came to pay the price that secures everything from God. Jesus came to pay the price that eliminated the separation from God. Jesus came to pay for my healing. Jesus came to pay for my freedom. Jesus came to pay for my breakthrough. Jesus came to give me access to God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 Bible says this, that praise and, and blessed and worthy of praise be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us. Everybody said the word with every, every spiritual blessing. Second Peter 1 verse 3 says, as his divine power has given us what? All things that pertains to life and godliness. Jesus made a way back to God. Gave us a, a VIP all access pass to Jesus. Therefore, the Bible says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Come boldly. Walk like you've been invited. Walk like you're a part of this family. Walk like you were a, your name is on the table. Walk like you know that God is your father. Why? Because God has thrown a big party. He has invited you. God has thrown a big party, but that's where things get complicated. Point number two, we determine who comes to the party. In this story, this man throws a party, and the Bible says when everything was ready, he, he, he sent his servants to go and tell people, hey, the food is ready, the banquet is ready, you can come and eat now. I was wondering what the difference was. There's an invitation from the master. The Bible says he invited many, but then he sends his servant to invite them. And I was thinking about it, and as I studied, I realized in that culture, you were told the day of the party, but you were not told the time of the party until the party was ready to start. So you can know that the party is going to start on a Thursday, Everybody knows Thursday is when the party is going to start, but nobody knows the time. When the banquet is ready, guess what happens? A servant or somebody is sent to tell you, hey, food is ready. How many of us wish that was the case now? That somebody told you when the food was ready. Like, no, like, I, my hand is up. Don't, don't tell me when the party is starting. Tell me when the food is ready. When you've given the first person food, call me, text me. Then I'm coming because then that's when the real party starts. <sighs> But here is the, 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 the dilemma. Let's say the master set up 50 chairs for 50 guests, sent out 50 in, in, like invites, told 50 people on Thursday, there's a party, there's a dinner party, I want you to come. And then he sends out his servant, and the servant only goes to 40 people. Guess how many people, how many people have a chance to come for the party? How many? 40, not 50, right? So if the servant has had an issue with somebody in the morning, let's say they did something to annoy him, and then the master says, go and invite everybody, and that person was invited, he would just walk past the house and look them in the eye 
and not say a word because I don't like you. You know what I'm trying to say? Okay, let's bring it home. If, let's say, the servant was a Republican and the next door neighbor is a Democrat and it's election year and I saw your post, I saw what you said on social media, you were not invited. So I'm not going to tell you that the food is ready. Let's say you know the person has different sexual orientation than you. And in your holy self, you tell them, I'm not going to tell you that there's food ready, that there's healing with your name on it, that there's freedom with your name on it, that there's breakthrough with your name, or that there's purpose and destiny with your name on it. I'm not going to tell you. So it's not how many people the master invited that came to come, that, 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 that have to come. It's those that the servants invited. It is the servant actually that determines the population, the people that actually make it into the room. It is some, most times we have blamed God for what the servants have done. The church is judgmental. Yes, God is a judge, but he's not judgmental as we understand it. It's the servants, you and I, that give God the bad PR he has. Because I went to church and nobody accepted me. Meanwhile, God is screaming from the window. Invite them. Tell them. Why are you walking past them? Say something to them. I have their name. I have a place for them in my house. But somehow, we are the bottlenecks for those that meet Jesus. We are the gatekeepers of Jesus. We determine who hears about Jesus. We determine what they think about Jesus. We determine what they think about the church. We are gatekeepers of Jesus, unsanctioned gatekeepers of Jesus. The Urban Dictionary defines gatekeeping as when someone takes it upon themselves to decide who does or does not have access or rights to a community, a place or a thing. So even though the mission statement of our church is inviting people to encounter God for an overflowing life in Jesus, guess who decides who gets invited? We decide that. We decide that. John chapter 7, verse 37 shows that Jesus has extended a universal invite. The Bible says, on the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, anyone, not some people, not church people, not just Christians. If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Before Jesus left, what did he tell his disciples? Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Go ye therefore and make disciples of who? Of all nations. In Mark 16 verse 15 he says, he said to them, go into the world, the whole world and preach the gospel. How many people are still sick, still broken, still lost? Still in bondage because we will not say anything to them. We will not tell them where we found the freedom that we enjoy. We will not tell them where we found the joy that we enjoy. We, we want to be spectacles. We want to be examples of the life that God gives. And meanwhile, people are waiting to experience the life that God has given to you. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19. You see what Jesus tells his disciples when they come to him for the very first time. He says, then he said to them, Follow me and I will make you. Most of us stop there. Follow me, I'll follow Jesus and he will make me prosperous. I'll follow Jesus and he will make me married. I'll follow Jesus and he will make me wealthy. I'll follow Jesus and he will make me a social media influencer. And as Moses came down from the mountain with his very first post and billions of people <laughs> still like the post till today. My posts will resonate throughout the world. Because I follow him so that he can make me. No, finish the sentence. I will make you fishers of men. He was talking to fishermen who knew how to catch fish. And he was telling them, I'm going to turn around and use that skill so that you can use the skill you use, you were born with, you're good with, to invite other people. Followers fish. The hallmark of a follower of Christ is that you fish for other people. The hallmark of a follower of Christ is that you invite other people. Followers, fish. Found people, find people. Found people, find people. 
Saved people, seek people. Invited people, invite other people. How dare we get keep Jesus? And meanwhile, he's at their door knocking and we're telling them, ignore the knock, ignore the knock. We're passively doing that. Because by not pointing them to the knock on the door, we're asking them to ignore the person who could change their lives forever. The servant had the power to do that. So my question to you today is, how many people are following Jesus because of you? How many people are now going to heaven because of you? How many people love God and love Jesus because of you? And Jesus is not just telling us to go like he told his disciples. This master gave a sentence that I like. The Bible says in Luke chapter 14, verse 21, then the master of the house said to his servants, go out quickly. Go out quickly. Go out quickly. Verse 23 says, the master said to the servants, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them. There is a sense of urgency. There is a sense of immediacy to this assignment. People are heading for hell. People are living below the best life that God has for them. Go out. That word actually is the Greek word that means to go out, to comfort off. It means to comfort from privacy. Most of us have our Christianity on private mode. And Sundays we, we share it a little bit with our friends, close friends, and then we slam it back to private mode on Monday. And nobody knows. And somebody's in your office and they tell you, man, my marriage is jacked up. And you're like, ooh, hey, yeah, that's, I'm sorry. Sorry to, sorry to hear that. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll pray for you. And, and you don't. You know, half the people that say I'll pray for you don't pray. <laughs> Meanwhile, that person has a place with their name. A re restored marriage with their name on it in the house of God. With Jesus, they have restoration. And we will not as much as point them in the direction of the freedom that we enjoy. Of the joy that we enjoy. Jesus is saying, come out of hiding. Come out of hiding in your community, amongst your friends. Come out of hiding in your workplace. Come out of hiding on social media. I know it's going to mess up the aesthetic of your feed. Your feed has an aesthetic. Maybe just put Jesus there one time. You know what I mean? Put it there and see what happens. I know he gave you the job and we would quickly post a picture of us in the new job or in the new car and not say anything about the, the God that gave you the job and gave you the car, which means the new joint. <laughs> Wonderful place. Culture is great. It's amazing. And then God is like waiting for his own post. When, when is he going to, what is he going to say? And you say nothing. The real fear of missing out is missing heaven. Missing out the lifetime of relationship with God. The worst thing, church people, I want you to hear me. The worst thing that can happen to you right now is you die and you go to heaven. That's the worst case scenario for you. The worst case scenario for them is that they die and go to hell. This is not a joke. Jesus has made way for everyone to come, but we decide who gets to meet Jesus. And where does he want us to go to invite people? The Bible says in verse 21 of Luke chapter 14, go quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city. This represents the people that you already have proximity to, those you're close with, those you have relationship and interaction with every day. Then he goes on to say in verse 23, go into the highways. Those are the people you have to, to travel to. Those are a little bit farther away from you. This is where um, um, digital media, text messaging, social media comes to play. You can reach across to somebody in another part of the world that you might never meet physically. But you can, that's, that's the highway. People that are far away from you. What does that look like? It looks like somebody, you see something about Jesus and you repost it. You, you never know. Then, oh, I had only five views. What if those five people are going to heaven? What if you have one million views and none of them are going to heaven? But you have five and all five of them. Why are we so caught up in how we feel when there are people who are dying and going to hell? 
Then he says, go to the hedges. That Greek word there, the hedge, is a fence. It's that which separates and prevents two people from coming together. The way I see it is this. We are not just commissioned to go to the people that we like, to the people that look like us. We are commissioned to go to the people who are separated from us, people we have issues with, people we don't see eye to eye. The way, the way I see it is like this, this servant, let's say the master had 50 seats and had sent out 50 um, invites, and then he tells the servant, oh, the food is ready, everything is piping hot, everybody's ready, everything, the, the whole environment is that go and tell them the party is ready. He goes in there and calls 40 people, comes back and tells the master, I've done what you said. And it sounds good. Everybody raise your hand as high as your hand can go. Raise your hand, your right hand as high as your hand can go. Everybody as high as your hand. Raise it even higher, even higher. Okay, stop. I said raise it as high as you can go. Why did you still have where to go when I said raise it even more? <laughs> That's what happened here. He comes back, master, I've done. As you said. The master said, no, 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 you have not. There are people far from you People you do not remember, far from your hearts, far from your memory. People far down on your list, you don't even consider them. The people that live close to you, the, the, the people who have a hedge around them, between you and them, there's a fence. People you don't like. Yes, I know your boss is irritating and the most wicked boss ever. But he or she still needs Jesus. I know that lady, your, your friend from school now, they, they're acting stupid. They're kids. Still need Jesus. Her marriage, his marriage, still needs Jesus. Your neighbor is the most annoying neighbor. They play loud music. They, they still need Jesus. He tells this man, go to the hedges. Go to the people that you ignored the first time. Go to the people that you had a problem with. Go to the people whose lives you're not comfortable, how they're living, the choices they are making, whatever they are, you're not, you don't just like it, so I just want to stay away from it. No, go to the tax collector, go to the sinners, go to somebody who you don't like and tell them that the party is ready. There is a seat, there is a place on the table with their name on it. They're not going to make up their name as they come. Their name was written from the foundation of the earth. They don't have to be awkward. They can come boldly to a party thrown by somebody who loves them. So go to the hedges. God is not a secret to be kept. Even from people that you don't like. Even from people that you think less of. Think of even less. God is not a secret to be kept. And who are we supposed to invite I like this story. It makes it very clear. It says, go quickly to the streets and the lanes. Bring in there, in here, the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Everybody said the poor. Everybody said the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. Those have meanings. The poor, that's the Greek word that means reduced to begging, reduced to asking for arms, destitute of wealth, of influence, of position, of honor, lacking in anything. In other words, people who do not have. How many of us know somebody who is lacking in something? Just reason if you don't. How many of us are the person lacking in something? There's something you're looking for that you don't have. That means there is a place for you in God's party. That means there's a place for them in God's party. He says the maimed, that word is the Greek word that means disabled in the limb, maimed, injured, bereft of some member of the body. That means it's a lack of something that limits activity, limits activity, li limits ability, sorry, limits ability. In other words, people who cannot do, whose ability and capacity has dropped because of something that happened in their life. They've lost someone, they've lost something, they've lost a job, lost their house, lost their car, lost, lost something in them that limits what they can do. Lame is the Greek word that means deprived of a foot. That means these are the people who cannot move. Who, people who have no mobility because of what they have lost. Then it goes on to say those who are blind, those who are mentally blind cannot see a future, cannot see anything bright, cannot see any hope, any future they can be excited about. It says this party is not for people who don't think they need Jesus. This party it's for those who lack something, the poor. This part is for those who cannot do the maim. This part is for those who are lame, those who, who cannot move, and those who are blind. This party is for broken people. This table is set for broken people. And all of us, 
knows a broken person, beginning with ourselves. If you're broken, that means you have an all-access all pass. If you're broken, that means you have a place at this table. This church is going to be like this table. This church is for people who are lacking something, who do not have. People who cannot do. People who are stuck. They cannot move. People who cannot see a future, they can be excited about. That's what this church is for. This church is not just for people who want to have their own seats in church and listen to their own music and enjoy and live on privacy mode. No! This church is for those who want to meet Jesus. Why? God is not a secret to be kept. We have to go now. Somebody say go now. No, no, say it like you mean. Say go now. Everybody say I have to go now. We have to go now. God has shown a great party. There's a sense of urgency because we determine who gets to come to this party. And point number three, there is still room at the party. Luke chapter 14 verse 21, the Bible says, Then the master of the house said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and into the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant says, it is done as you commanded. I've done what you said. But here's the problem. There is still room. Everybody say, there is still room. 23 says, the master said to the servant, said, then go out. If there's still room, go out into the highway, into the hedges, and compel them to come. And here is why. That my house may be filled. When did we get this concept that the church is supposed to be small? The heart of God is for a full house. It's not about numbers. Hear me carefully. If a church can seat 50 people, it's better have 50 people in there. If a church can seat 15,000 people, guess how many people you should have? 15,000. It's not the number. It's that a church is living up to its capacity to invite people to Jesus. And the capacity is decided by the empty seats beside you. Right now, everybody look. Practically, look around you. Look for an empty seat. Count the empty seats. No, this, this is practical. Look around. Turn, turn around. There are seats behind there. Those of you who are watching, you don't see this, but I'll tell you. There are seats covered with black cloth behind there. Every empty seat is somebody who did not meet Jesus today. God trusted us. Let me, okay, this was my first service. You guys are here. You get this. God trusted us with the wherewithal to be able to pay for a room that can sit 756 people. You know why? It's not about a big church. Please hear me. It's, he says, these people can introduce 756 people to me every week. So I will give them the money to pay for a room that can sit 756 people. These people have the infrastructure to work the technology for thousands and millions of people to be watching live online. If you're watching online, look at the number who's watching. That shows how many people missed out on Jesus today. Because the goal of God is that the room is full. And not just the church. The goal of God is that the, every room in your community is filled with people that love God. The goal of God is that every office is filled with people that love him. Every playground, every school is filled. That our kids can go on YouTube safely because every video on their feet is by somebody who loves Jesus. The goal of God is that my house, the rooms are filled. Every table that is set is filled. And here is the thing. If they come here, scratch that. When they come here, they're going to find hope. They're going to find that we love them. They're going to find joy. They're going to find peace. They're going to find restoration. They're going to find the Jesus that they want. There's still room. There's still work to do. Now, as I'm saying this, most of you are like, man, Pastor Vic, I, I don't know if I have it in me to preach to somebody. Like, I don't even know two Bible verses. Maybe John 3, 16. That's even that one. I just know God so loved the world, man. And then there's some things you do, then you have everlasting life. <laughs> it's okay. So let's make it easy. What if our next step, our collective next step, 
is to invite somebody to church. When you tell somebody about food you ate at a restaurant, I don't see you going in there to prepare the food yourself. The steak here is great. Meanwhile, sit down. I'll be back. Then you go in there and cook it up. No, 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 no. What we can guarantee you, I am Pastor Ambi, is that the well, I know you don't know how to articulate the message of Christ yet. We're going to learn how to do that. But you can invite them into a space where you have pastors who will make sure that somebody has spent considerable amount of time during the week to articulate the gospel in such a way that somebody can encounter Jesus. What you can be sure of is there's going to be a praise and worship team. There's going to be a dream team, a parking lot team that is going to love them, that's going to lead them into the presence of God. All you have to do is pass the notes and just chill. Let God do what he wants to do. All you have to do is tell somebody to come and enjoy what you have enjoyed. You don't even have to be in church the day they come. You can just tell them. If they need you to be, then awesome. What is wrong in waking up early? To make sure. If they need to be picked up, what is a little bit of gas to make sure somebody meets Jesus? What if we take it upon ourselves to invite somebody to a space? Just imagine how wonderful you feel. You know this person does not love Jesus. <laughs> and then after the message, during the worship, they are crying. While you are worshiping, you're like, excited. Go do it. And then they lean back. And you know they have a problem in their marriage. And they tell them, I'm going to call her today after this service. And you're like, yes. The message ends. And then the altar call, the, 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 the call for those who want to meet Jesus is made. And while, yeah, the instruction is all heads bowed and all eyes closed. One of your eyes open. You want to like, you want to see if they, if they raise their hand. And in that victorious moment, they gain the confidence and they raise their hand. And then you realize that one text message has decided the eternal destiny of someone. Think of how much joy you will have knowing that when you get to heaven, there will be people coming out of their own mansion saying, man, I'm here because of you. I'm here because you did something bold. I'm here because you told me about a place where I could meet Jesus. Think of how much joy that would be. How many of us are going to do that? You're, you're committing to do that. Let us lift up your hands. You're committing to do that. How many of us cannot wait to see the joy and the peace and the hope that people experience when they come to Jesus? If that is, you put your hands together and celebrate God.